Excellent. Greetings, everyone, and welcome to the second webinar in our 2021 Route County Wildfire Mitigation Conference. Tonight's presentations and discussions focus on the home ignition zone and ready, set, go, with the goal of informing and preparing you as individual homeowners and ranchers. Thanks to all those joining us here tonight. It's a pleasure to have you. My name is Nathan Stewart. I'm faculty in the Sustainability Studies program at Colorado Mountain College. This is one of our college's bachelor degrees and one keenly interested in understanding wildfire science and behavior and the role of mitigation and preparedness in ensuring a sustainable future for our community. I'll say a few opening words here before welcoming tonight's two expert panelists to the room with us. First, I'd like to briefly recognize our organizing committee, Colorado State Forest Service, Yampa Valley Sustainability Council, Route County Emergency Operations, Colorado Mountain College, CSU Extension, Steamboat Ski and Resort Corporation, and the Steamboat Springs Board of Realtors. I'd also like to recognize our title sponsors of the 2021 conference, the Steamboat Springs Board of Realtors and the Colorado Association of Realtors. Our sincere thanks to both organizations for your unwavering commitment to wildfire mitigation. Tonight's presentation is being recorded and it'll be linked to our website post event in front of you as a static image of our website landing page. Please visit this site for recordings of all webinars, including this one post event, as well as other information essential to tonight's topic. We hope to interact with you as an audience tonight via Zoom. So here's a few words about how we'll do so. Conference attendees, if you're looking at the lower left of the screen, are automatically muted in webinar formats, so rest assured that's the case in this format. You're asked to communicate via icons and we'll use a couple here preferentially. Um, you're likely familiar given this year of Zoom work we've all had here behind us, the Q&A will prioritize. Please ask your questions there. That can start as soon as your questions occur to you. Don't hesitate to do so. You can raise your hand if you'd like to speak your question aloud in the time allotted at the end of this evening. If you happen to be calling in tonight, you can also participate in these two forms of communication. Star nine will allow you to um, place a question in Q&A. Star six will allow you to mic in and for us to bring your voice into the evening tonight. Don't hesitate to do that um, should you have a question you'd like to voice. Folks behind the scenes will be monitoring both the Q&A um, and the raise hand feature tonight. So to help set the scene for tonight's conversation, I'd like to briefly feature a handful of quotes from last Thursday's conference kickoff. We encourage you to watch the full conversation. I won't read these in full, you're welcome to start them here, but wanted to, to bring a couple forward um, before we welcome our panelists. So here a quote from Chief White, a reminder of the extreme fire behavior we have so recently become familiar with. So speaking to the East Troublesome Fire, and that um, memorable day, Wednesday night, October 21st, um, that set this fire on course to become, of course, the second largest wildland fire um, in the state's history, but importantly, as um, Chief White points out, the most destructive um, in, in, dollar, um, in dollars in the state's history. The second quote here, um, this is from Kevin Thompson, a reminder of the recipe for wildfire and the change we're witnessing year on year that's most conducive to that recipe, right? And I think an experience that we could all reflect on here, waiting for that typical monsoon to come, which did not come or was patchy at best in this last fire year, 2020. I'll follow with a quote here from John Twitchell. And it's a, a critical reminder that fire is of course a natural part of our ecology and ecosystem health and also that we have a role in driving change through our activities and that we have a role in increasing our own risk given our willingness to live where we do right now. A quote from Dan Gibbs here to follow. Dan putting into perspective our rapidly changing population 
and housing density, and therefore wildland urban interface here in Colorado, underlining that sort of remarkable um, stat at the end there, um, how many of us in the state now live within that zone. I wanted to finish with a final quote from Maud Morat here, and I think this is the setting um, for us for bringing in our two panelists this evening, highlighting response to the Deep Creek fire here, and really underlining the importance of being connected and informed to ensure our own safety, given where we live, right, in the Intermountain West where we do here. And so I'll underline it, perhaps we can do so via the chat, the importance of reverse 911 and being in that network routecountyalerts.com um, that you see Mo refer to here and that many of us signed up as a result of um, that discussion at last week's webinar. So without further ado, it's my privilege to welcome our colleague Dan Beveridge to the room here with us first. I'll introduce Dan here and save our um, second expert panelist here, Todd Hagenbu, um, introduction for the midpoint. I wanna ensure if folks join us late that they have an opportunity to get to meet Todd if they haven't already. So we'll start here with Dan. Dan is the Wildfire Mitigation Program Specialist for Colorado State Forest Service. He manages a variety of statewide programs that promote forest and watershed health, fire management success, community fire adaptation, and awareness of fire's role in ecosystems. Dan has spent the majority of his professional career as an operational wildland firefighter with local, state, and federal agencies in Arizona and Colorado. He values the importance of collaboration in promoting resilience and maintains numerous national wildfire coordinating group operational and planning qualifications. He's also an International Society of Arb Culture certified arborist and holds a master's degree in natural resource stewardship with a forest science concentration from Colorado State University, Fort Collins. Dan, welcome. It's truly a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thanks, Nathan. I appreciate the introduction. Uh, great job leading in with those excellent quotes to kind of round us out and get us in a center point. That's really helpful. I look forward to watching the recording from that session earlier. Bear with me for a moment, everyone, while I get this screen shared and then we can be off. Can you let me know if you're seeing what we ought to be? Dan, that looks great. We have your full screen there as you maximize. Excellent. Great. Again, Nathan, thank you. Thanks to all the participants. It looks like we have around 70 folks uh, participating live. That's great. Um, obviously, knowing this will be recorded, uh, is being recorded, we look forward to other folks um, gaining benefit from what we discuss here this evening. Um, already provided in an introduction, talk very briefly about my organization. Hopefully some of you that are viewing are uh, already familiar with my organization, the Colorado State Forest Service. We have a local field office uh, in Steamboat Springs, but our mission is to achieve stewardship of Colorado's diverse forest environments for the benefit of present and future generations. Um, my perspective with this presentation on the home ignition zone, again, due in great part to my experience, as Nathan mentioned, as a wildland firefighter is really where a lot of this is grounded. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with some uh, wildfire fundamentals, that's what I'm going to start us off with. Uh, so the, the fire triangle um, is very basic. You know, there are many jokes about how firefighters are simplistic types of people and like to break things down into very <laughs> simple ideas. Um, it's, it's beneficial to be able to do that uh, with certain complex topics. So here I'm showing everybody the fire triangle that is composed of fuel, heat, and oxygen. And without any one of those vital components, we cannot have fire um, in any capacity. Um, so that's critical and critically important information. When we move on to the fire behavior triangle, this is something that's embedded into the minds of wildland firefighters. And um, it's these three components that dictate how a fire will burn. So topography essentially is the lay of the land, uh, what the terrain looks like. The weather is very obvious, you know, wind, relative humidity, precipitation, 
so on. Uh, and then fuel is another critically important part. And I put it down there at the bottom because as you'll see in my next slide, it's arguably the most important one that we can discuss. And when I say fuel, it's important to recognize that in the mind of the wildland firefighter and hopefully for everybody participating here, you will start to think of fuel as pine needles and grasses and trees and shrubs and all of these other things that can potentially burn under the right conditions in the wildfire environment. So again, reiterating what one of my points from the last uh, slide is the only one of those three variables in the uh, fire behavior triangle that you as landowners or homeowners and us as land managers can control really is fuels. You know, doesn't matter how many bulldozers or other earth moving pieces of equipment you put out there on the landscape, you're, you're not going to appreciably <laughs> change the topography that exists. And cloud seeding isn't a reasonable answer to some of the issues that we're dealing with from a climatological perspective. So it's the fuels, the things that burn that we can reasonably manipulate uh, and adjust. So it's fundamental to managing fire, understanding the, the complex fuel environments that we deal with. Um, and again, it's also fundamental to understand how to prevent any damage to our values at risk. So whether it's your home or your shed or your fence or a ranch property, uh, anything, thinking about it all as fuel is vitally important. So this is the first time, but it won't be the last time here. You'll see at the bottom that I'll introduce this quote from Dr. Jack Cohen. If it doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. I'll bring that theme up numerous times throughout uh, my brief presentation here this evening. So again, centering us in the mind of the, the wildland firefighter, there are all sorts of ways that we as wildland firefighters are trained to conceptualize and, and, and make second nature the idea of fuels. And this image that I have up here is unfortunately an out of date publication that I considered just really invaluable in a lot of the assignments that I would go on. Because as you can see in the bottom right side, it breaks out fuels amongst all the geographic regions, at least in the continental US, but includes Alaska as well. And it provides very valuable information about how fuels differ in one region of the country compared to the one that you might be from and be most accustomed to. So for a firefighter, we think basically about gathered fuel complexes. Are fires burning in grass alone? Is it in grass shrub? Is it in shrubs alone, timber understory? I don't need to read all of those off, but the way that fire behaves in those fuel complexes is significantly different. And, and it's not uncommon at all for any one small locale in Colorado to, or any other place for that matter, to represent a number of these different types of fuel complexes. There's a significant amount of geographic variability and diversity. And we're gonna talk a little bit more about some of these characteristics so that y'all can get a little bit more familiar with them. But this last point that I put down here to reiterate that point of fuels really being anything that can burn and, you know, of late, it, you know, most recently in my career, I've seen a lot more situations in which I've been around homes dealing with wildfires and we realistically have to consider those homes just like any of the other natural vegetative fuels as something that will burn and something that needs to be addressed as such, and therein as a portion of the conversation here overall is helping to get everybody accustomed to how to prevent these things that are so valuable to us from burning. When it comes to, to home ignition, um, it seems as if there's a common understanding that fire in you know a broad sweeping sense has to actually be in a flaming front of wall and then, you know, make contact with a structure or any kind of value at risk. And I um, want to ensure that everybody understands that that is not the case. Embers, which are firebrands, wind, wind born material um, can be any sorts. It could be natural or man-made. Um, could be pieces of material from the bark of a certain type of a tree or a cluster of pine needles. Those are what embers are. And those are actually the leading cause of home ignition and damage or loss in the wildfire environment. Um, extremely unpredictable. They can travel terribly long distances. And uh, it is by far the greatest vulnerability that we all have to recognize uh, living and working in, in you know, a natural environment. So if you look at that picture on the bottom and the left, you'll see that the majority of the fire that's burning in that image is a fair distance away. But you see a small cluster of fire at the steps of that property. 
And you can see if you look very closely, and I apologize if you can't see too terribly well, but there's a large cluster of pine needles down there that were fairly clearly ignited by an ember of some sort. This home was a complete loss. Um, transitioning over to the idea of surface fire, um, loss of a structure or a value uh, to surface fire is very much preventable. Um, really all that we have to do to eliminate that type of damage or loss is to eliminate the fuels that are direct, directly adjacent to the structure. Moving on to an additional cause of home ignition, by no means to downplay its importance, uh, relevance, or possibility, is the idea of radiant heat. Um, and sufficient radiant heat to ignite and damage or um, cause a complete loss of a structure can be caused by an adjacent crown fire. And what I mean by that is a larger cluster of continuous trees or um, material, it could be shrubs even for that matter, um, that put off sufficient heat to actually ignite a home and then cause it to be lost. But as you can see in this picture from the National Fire Protection Association, when you have a densely clustered uh, set of homes, if one home starts, there's very little that can keep that fire from moving over to the next home. Um, so those are the three primary causes of home ignition, embers, surface fire, and radiant heat. Um, but what is the home ignition zone? What, what is it that I'm giving a presentation on here? Um, why does it matter? This is what the home ignition zone is. It's the home and everything surrounding it. So it includes the home itself. And then it's also the natural vegetation or unnatural materials, you know, man-made piles of tires, for example. Again, the shed that I mentioned earlier, the fence, no matter what the construction build or length, um, all of those things. These are the two primary de determinants of home ignition. How ignitable the structure itself is and any material that may be on it. And then defensible space, which I'll provide a more uh, definitive explanation of in a few slides here. But it's really the... Um, nature of the vegetation that surrounds that home or that structure. Uh, the home ignition zone of the HIZ concept was developed in the late 1990s by uh, Dr. Jack Cohen, who worked for the US Forest Service for a number of years. He was a physical scientist and he did a significant number of experiments, primarily wanting to answer the question of how much radiant heat would be required to char and ignite certain materials because he was working to answer some of these questions that hadn't been asked by too many people previously. And again, he was the one that turned this, uh, or, or came up with this quote, if it doesn't ignite it, it, it doesn't burn. Thinking as many scientists do in very kind of simplistic, basic, fundamental terms. And it's really beneficial for us in many, many ways when we can break things down into a simple type of concept. Um, this idea uh, has been consistently reinforced by many experiments and, and a lot of post-fire research across the country. Um, there's been a lot of very valuable research produced by the Insurance Institute for Building and Home Safety, uh, especially where they've done a lot of review along with the National Fire Protection Association um, of loss situations in California predominantly, but all over the country, a lot of these studies have been done proving that embers and other means of ignition can, can start homes and they can transfer from one to the next. So here's some graphic imagery to uh, help explain these concepts. I don't have the before photo uh, of the picture on the left, but you can see that there's not really that much there that a fire could possibly burn. I am not by any means saying that your property has to look exactly like this one necessarily because this is a representative fuel type um, of kind of a general area in Colorado. And I'm sure there are a lot of places in Route County that look rather similar to this. On the right, you'll see an image uh, working to convey the preventing structural ignitability, excuse me, ignitability, in which we are working to separate the home from any kind of flammable uh, environment adjacent to it and uh, harden it basically from any of those other means of heat transfer that I mentioned earlier. So when we're talking about structural ignitability and reducing a structure's ignitability, we frequently transition or use an alternate phrase of home hardening. So we're really talking about the same kind of thing, but just in a different type of context. Um, this idea of home hardening is, is just adjusting the environment or the character of a structure itself to minimize damage or loss from any type of wildfire influence. So again, think back to those earlier images 
of embers. And imagine an ember shower raining down upon this structure, right? One of the reasons why this metallic flashing has been installed between the siding of this particular structure and the roof is because that's an area where frequently needles and other vegetative debris will gather on a structure, but also those are the same locations in which windborne embers will land. So if we have a non-flammable environment there, we can worry significantly less about the home potentially catching fire. A lot of words here, sorry. <laughs> We're not gonna cover every single one of these in significant depth, um, but these are just a, an example of some of the activities that can be done to harden a home. Um, ensuring that the roof is, has a class A fire rating, basically means it's resistant to ignition. Um, removing any of that material from uh, anywhere on the property itself to include the roof, which is one of the most important areas, of course, but gutters, decks, any other locations like that, particularly those that have significant surface areas. Um, screening any openings in the home is a very, very important uh, action to take when it comes to preventing those embers, which we can never possibly know where they will land, from entering a home. So that screening material will basically um, do a significantly better job of preventing that from happening if there were nothing there whatsoever. Tempered glass can help to prevent breakage and then ember intrusion or any other heat source intrusion. Um, using multiple panes is, is, is really good. As you can see on this home, it's a good exhibition of having uh, an appreciable amount, six inches or more of vertical clearance of non-flammable material from where the edging starts to where the ground surface is. And then replacing combustible deck or fencing material at least directly adjacent to the home. Um, the list goes on. I mean, there are really a lot of comprehensive resources available out there, um, but it's important to recognize that every action helps. And I don't want to lead too much into potential questions that we may have, but um, not all of these can or reasonably should be expected to be completed in a weekend. But every one that you do, now that you understand a little bit more now about homes, can be exposed to heat, which can damage or cause losses with them. You can understand maybe a little better that every single one that you do really improves the odds uh, of eliminating loss. Um, if it doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. Transitioning onto defensible space. Here you can see a before image of, uh, of this home that you saw in one of the earlier slides, excuse me. But what defensible space is, is the area surrounding the home or structure where fuels have been modified to reduce the fire behavior intensity. It's generally up to 100 feet. It can be more depending on slopes or um, other factors, but uh, really the idea essentially is to do what firefighters do, what wildland firefighters do. Um, when we're working on reducing fuels in a variety of environments, um, it can cause less spotting, which can compromise our fire lines. Um, and when I say producing or receiving, when we're talking about spotting, we're thinking about what happens after an ember lands in a receptive fuel bed, essentially. So whether that fuel bed is a dry pine needle somewhere um, in a natural environment, or on the steps of a home, or on the roof in the gutters, for example. Um, so with, with less fuel overall, we can expect less spotting in a lot of situations. So not only when it comes to the production of those um, threats, but also uh, in, in the receiving sense. When you have fewer fuels, there is physically, from a scientific perspective, less ability for there to be heat produced sufficient enough to impact a home in a negative fashion or any other value for that matter. And then certainly with significantly fewer fuels there, there's greater opportunity for direct engagement success. And what I mean by that is successful firefighter invention. And I put an asterisk there because here on the next screen you'll see, and I'm emphasizing this for good reason, that this concept of defensible space is not meant to imply that fire resources will be there at any one structure, home, um, infrastructure, uh, asset, anything of that sort um, to provide protection. Uh, that's what we take pride in being able to do in certain environments, 
but it goes without saying that um, the lives and safety and well-being of firefighters cannot be compromised for um, homes and other values. Defensible space should be thought of as a means of minimizing fire behavior so the home can defend itself. This concept of standing alone is one that we as, as firefighters really like to um, convey emphatically because that's kind of our um, ideal end state in which we wouldn't have to worry too much about trying to find every property and then working on every property in advance of a fire front coming to that area. If we can let the fire burn and let the homes withstand that impact, that's an ideal end state, not only for the homeowners and the landowners, but also for the fire resources and the fire managers. So again, the root purpose of creating defensible space is to do the same thing as wildland firefighters do. I got a little bit ahead of myself there, I apologize. We basically separate and reduce fuels and we keep fire from spreading um, in a basic sense. Um, so though requiring interpretation, what you see here in this image is in fact defensible space. So one way to envision this, if you, if you see what's occurring on the left, there's a firefighter there with a drip torch and um, if you imagine that area where the main fire is, this is actually a burnout operation occurring. But if you imagine that there was a home on the other side, outside of the frame that we can't actually see, um, this then would clearly be defensible space. It's an area of reduced fuel to minimize the activity of the fire that's occurring there. Um, so I'll leave it at that. Uh, Told you I'd get pretty deep into the idea of fuel characteristics, and I'm just highlighting a few of these just to really emphasize that idea of defensible space. But when we're talking about that idea, it's fuel loading. It's the amount or the volume, the physical amount of fuel that is present there. So when we're working on defensible space, we really just need to reduce that. Continuity is really a critical concept. We can have all sorts of fuels in all sorts of places, but really if they're discontinuous, we disallow that fire in many instances from being able to move from, from one fuel bed to the next. And then vertical arrangement is similar to the continuity concept, but we're just talking about lateral arrangements on the ground or even in the air. <clears throat> but these are the most critical concepts when it comes to fuels. So if you can start thinking about things that way, when you start to envision defensible space, that's really beneficial. Um, I'm not sure, Nathan, can you confirm whether or not uh, the audience has been introduced to the idea of our updated home ignition zone guide? Well, it would actually be great to have you speak to it here, Dan, if you're willing. Sure, uh, I better not do it now because I won't be able to finish my presentation in time, but we can certainly address it, maybe a question and answer at the end. Um, or... Yeah, that's great. I'd be happy to bring us back there. Okay, great, thanks. Um, so in order to make uh, this concept a little bit more manageable, but also for um, a lot of basic fundamental fire behavior types of reasons, we divide up that 100 foot defensible space area into multiple zones. And zone one is zero to five feet from the structure, and this should be a non-combustible area. It really links the structure to the remainder of the defensible space and the rest of the property. And it is the most important of the three defensible space zones to take immediate action on. Zone two is between five and 30 feet from the structure. And again, discontinuous fuels are really kind of a key point here. Eliminating ladder fuels, you know, shorter branches and trees that could connect these grasses that you see in this image to the tree canopies to eliminate fire from being able to move from surface fuels into canopy fuels or aerial fuels in which they're significantly more challenging to manage and unpredictable. Um, separating tree crowns, separating shrub clumps, uh, again, eliminating ladder fuels, like I mentioned a moment ago, uh, and then mowing grass, because the shorter the grass is, um, the less flame lengths can be produced by, um, excuse me, those particular fires and those kinds of, uh, those fuels. Zone three is 30 to 100 feet from the structure. Uh, in this area, you should just work your best to avoid large concentrations of slash and debris. Again, eliminate ladder fuels. And, you know, of course, the Colorado State Forest Service, we work to uh, promote um, active forest management for diversity and health reasons, not only for uh, your property in general, but also for watershed wildlife and uh, a variety of other purposes. Where do I start? It's a question that, that always occurs. Um, and 
starting at the home is the most important because if we think back on the idea that I mentioned of ember ignition being the most important, uh, most prominent threat to a lot of structures is we can do all we want to have uh, the most ideal looking defensible space, but a single ember could compromise that defensible space. So it's critically important for us to understand that we eliminate all option of ignitability from the structure itself. This roof is not a good example of how a property should look. Again, for all of those reasons that I had mentioned, uh, it is not a rated material, a very flammable uh, shake shingle roof, and there's a significant amount of debris there. One of the reasons roofs are the most prominent part is because they have such a significant amount of surface area. If anything is flammable on them and they do ignite, um, it can lead to negative consequences, certainly. Um, the vents that I mentioned earlier, there's a variety of vents uh, depending on what kind of home that you have, but by putting up screening on those vents, uh, it's very, very uh, advantageous uh, and uh, meant to eliminate ember intrusion. Um, when it comes to decks, storing materials below them can be a poor choice simply because if those materials were to ignite, uh, they're flammable of any sort and any such an arrangement in which if they were to ignite and one started burning and the rest would, in theory, they could uh, compromise your deck or the rest of the structure. Regular, re regularly removing debris, although it can be an unpleasant task, is a quite important step to take. Um, transitioning into defensible space, again, that zone one from zero to five feet between the home or the structure. Uh, and the rest of the property is the one that should be prioritized and then move outward from there. When does it end? The unfortunate answer is really never. <laughs> Maintenance is critical. You know, trees will continue to grow, grasses will grow, shrubs will grow, they will shed leaves. Um, this is a good thing. Uh, although this can be difficult, one of the reasons that I like sharing some of these images is it, it does a good job of representing <laughs> The fact that it can be fun, especially if you do it with young folks or your neighbors or other folks like that. But um, I like the smile on this, this little helper space. It's great. Kind of bringing things uh, mostly back around. I kind of created my own triangle here to convey some of these concepts. Um, so I won't spend too much time on this one. These are kind of two of the three triangles we had already discussed. But when we move to this other triangle, a vulnerability triangle for your structure, um, again, think about if your home doesn't ignite, it doesn't burn. If you combine the condition of the home as the base and foundation of the triangle with the defensible space that you can uh, take action with and manipulate these fuels, this fuel complex, really, um, there's no way that you will necessarily be able to know what kind of fire conditions will exist. But if you have done everything that you can on these two sides of the triangle, you're really stacking the odds in your favor for minimizing any losses for your values on your property. Um, I will very briefly talk about this fire adapted communities concept. We might be able to roll into this with question and answer. Uh, I know there's a lot going on in this image, but I did just want to bring to your attention this resident and community mitigation concept that's down here at the bottom. It involves defensible space and home hardening. Um, the concept of becoming adapted to fires and inevitable impacts are quite important. That's really one of the reasons why we're talking about these topics but it's a comprehensive, larger scale kind of effort. Um, I better just leave it at that because I want to be time sensitive to make sure that we can cover everything else that we wanted to. Um, so these are my concluding slides. Thanks again for your time and attention. There are no guarantees in the wildfire environment. Okay, that's something that's really important for us to emphasize. I, I again, really appreciate Nathan providing the really beneficial lead in that he had uh, at the beginning here, but we have to understand that we are incorporating a, an appreciable amount of, of risk, wildfire risk living in a lot of the environments that we do. Wildfire is no stranger to these landscapes, although the times that it returns is variable from one uh, kind of ecosystem to the next. Um, but there are many things that we can do uh, <clears throat> to be better prepared. We don't know exactly what our future climate will hold for us, but it appears that the conditions are pointing to the fact that we will have more frequent fires and increased intensity. So it's all the more reason to, to take all the actions that we know uh, will improve our chances of success in the future. 
there are a large number of independent guidance resources uh, available to homeowners and landowners and so on, but there really is no substitute for a site visit performed by a subject matter expert, a, a, a specialist in wildfire mitigation concepts. We know a lot about this stuff and it's great because we have all sorts of really creative tools and techniques by which we can share a lot of these ideas. Um, there are actions that every homeowner and landowner can take to improve wildfire outcomes, but the time to act is now, before the next fire season comes. Um, collaboration and community involvement really is critical. The amount of work that can be done when people work together is, is tremendous, and we can really see some great success when we work together rather than independently. But every action counts. Um, resources are abundant and help is available. Lots of resources, don't have time to discuss them here. Uh, I've provided some to uh, everybody I think that's involved here and I will end it there. Almost right at 25 minutes. Thank you. Excellent, thank you, Dan. Um, stellar presentation, really rich information here. We're watching questions coming in to us um, for you. I would encourage those in attendance um, to continue to post your questions there. Um, Dan, in interest of time, I'll shift us over to our second speaker, and then can we call you back in um, as we complete our second panelist here for an open Q&A? That would be great. Sure thing, Nathan. Awesome. And to follow up to Dan's um, final slide here with resources, those in attendance received a packet um, that Dan provided some really um, excellent supporting documents for us in. Please look to that packet, and we'll close out here with, with a... Um, a pathway to our website that will have more of those um, key pieces too. Dan, thanks again. Excellent. Well, I'd like to transition us now to our second um, expert panelist here, Todd Higginboo. It's our pleasure to host Todd this evening. Todd is the Ag Natural Resources Agent and County Director for Colorado State University Extension in Route County. He is the fourth generation of his family to ranch in Route County and understands firsthand the challenges um, surrounding ranching on the West Slope. Wildfire preparation and the need to think through those efforts hit home for Todd and his family when the Green Creek Fire, 2002, burned above his family's ranch and they were kept from grazing cattle on their forest permit due to the fire. He began his career in extension in 2012 and handles all manners of agricultural issues, including land management, weed identification and control, horticulture, family succession facilitation, and more. Todd, welcome. It's truly a pleasure to have you here tonight. Thank you, Nathan. I appreciate that. I assume you can see my screen and hear me okay? Okay, the thumbs up. So Nathan told you all I do as an ag agent. So my apologies first, if you've heard me talk about this subject before uh, on the West Slope, as we've talked about drought mitigation measures for farm and ranch families on the West Slope before. And my apologies too, if you've spent the last two nights talking about gardening with me, <laughs> with the evenings with the master gardeners. Uh, you get one more night, but we're gonna talk a little differently tonight about a subject that is so important to all of us who live, um, live out in the country. We were talking earlier about that wildland urban interface and how many people live in that. If you live in the country, you've always dealt with this. And uh, we need to acknowledge that we've always um, had some risk living out in the countryside. So while I'm gonna talk tonight uh, mostly about uh, our farms and ranches uh, in Route County, how we prepare, if you're a property owner at all, uh, what we're going to talk about tonight is really important. Dan talked about everything that relates to defending your home. And when you're in farming and ranching, um, life is complicated enough, but a wildfire makes it more complicated. And knowing that it's not just your home, um, as Dan talked about, but your buildings, your business, and really your ranch is your factory. Um, the home is your office. When you pile all of those different levels of complexity on a ranch, it makes it that much more complicated. And, uh, and as the CEO of your ranching business, it is your responsibility to not only take care of your home as the, the homeowner, but of your business as the CEO. And as a CEO, you have that responsibility to make a plan. Um, having those plans in place now before it's too late can really help you think through what you need to do as far as mitigation efforts, and then also how you start to recover soon after the fire. And 
that will ultimately save you money. And we know if you are a rancher, um, <laughs> time and money are very scarce resources. The little investment on both of those now will save you bunches and bunches of both later on. So I ask you, are you ready at, in your property? Or, or is it ready for a wildfire? And I would venture to say that for most of you, it probably isn't. So I ask you, if it isn't ready, what are you going to do about it? Let's think through um, some of the process that would that you'd go through to uh, try to plan for a wildfire. So what should you think about first when making that plan? First, think about the services that are available to you. Dan just said it so well. Have a professional come out, look at your area, and talk to you about what are some of the mitigation efforts you can do? Um, you've got enough to worry about. Um, you're, you're an irrigator. You're a calf puller. You're a breeder. Uh, you're a machinery uh, me mechanic and machinery specialist. You do all that. You can't be expected to know how to also mitigate and prepare for a fire. So have a professional come out and talk to you about that. Then think about once you're starting to make that plan, if I'm not here to carry out my plan, who is responsible? Uh, we, we talked earlier, Nathan brought up uh, some of the quotes from last week's conference about the East Troublesome Fire. That was in October. Fall is one of the rare times that you can get off your ranch, whether you've weaned and already shipped a small window of opportunity to get out and maybe um, leave the ranch for a week or two for vacation, or if you, uh, you haven't weaned yet and the calves are still in the cows, you can get away. Well, in October, you don't think about wildfire happening. It certainly did for our neighbors in Graham County. So if I've made this plan and I'm not here and a fire does happen, who's responsible? Ask your neighbors, have they planned? And what are you doing together that will impact one another? And what are they doing that impacts you? And if your neighbors are gone, what are your responsibilities? Do you have a responsibility? Something you need to ask yourself. So again, we're gonna keep talking about what should you think about when making a plan? The first thing I'd ask you is, what would be the worst thing that you can imagine to have damaged or lose from a personal perspective? Again, your home, your ranch, your business, your factory, they're all one thing. So from a personal perspective, uh, what's important? Now, of course, we would think that human life, of course, would be at the top of the list and maybe the pets, but you've got lots of other animals. Then you've also probably got a lot of history in your ranch. If you're a multi-generational rancher, um, what are some of those personal items that maybe uh, maybe it was the, the harness that grandpa had with his horses that he's handed down through the generations? What would you feel? How would you feel about losing that? Um, so from the personal perspective, where what are you going to want to save? Then you've got to think too from the business perspective. We'll talk a little bit more about this, but what do you need to get back into business in the event of a fire? Uh, what records do you have that need saved? You're running a business as well, so you need to think from a business perspective what's really important to plan for. And then we've got this really complex issue of where are the ethics behind what we need to plan for. We have livestock and animals, lives that are under our care. So what do you need to plan for for them? We also work in a business that has a lot of potentially dangerous items around, um, oftentimes in proximity to waterways, uh, whether that's herbicides and pesticides or fuel. From an ethical perspective, if I haven't planned for those items in the event of a wildfire, what kind of problems am I causing to my neighbors, my community, and those around me? My question for you all too, and I'm no insurance um, agent, but I ask you, are you insured enough? And first, what do you have insured? Are the buildings insured? Do you have specific livestock that are insured? Maybe your prized bull, maybe some uh, cow that you bought at the National Western, maybe she's insured, but, uh, but most of your animals aren't. How about machinery? Uh, maybe some of the machines are, or are insured, maybe not. Uh, when you go out and spend $100,000 on a tractor, which is really easy to do these days, maybe insuring it isn't something you've thought of, but can you replace that if it's burned up? How about tools and other items that uh, your business relies on? Do you have documentation in a safe place? And again, we talk about the important personal documentation, your wills, your state plans, things of that nature. But again, you're running a business. What is the IRS going to need to keep? Um, do you have your breed registrations and your depreciation schedules somewhere that you can grab those in a hurry? How about photos of all those items? What can you store in the cloud so that isn't something else that you're trying to gather up if and when the fire comes? And then also, have you considered what you've insured 
uh, how that may alter your plan. If as a business, you, uh, you have thought through what you can replace, great. But think how insurance can impact that. If that $100,000 tractor is not insured and you can't afford to replace it, maybe you need to worry about getting it out of there. If it is insured, perhaps your priorities should lie somewhere else. So also what should you think about? Uh, think about the, all those things you need to consider. Just take a moment, think about your home, your business, your property, your animals. It's mind boggling, all the things you need to think about. Certainly as Dan was talking about, what would you think about just for our home? It's mind boggling, but multiply that tenfold and maybe get an idea of if you're a rancher or you're a large property owner, what you need to think about. Then I ask you what else you might need to think about when making a plan. And we're gonna run through some of these. Um, <clears throat> one, if you have a fire, and don't think of this just being a wildfire. Maybe it's a building fire. Maybe you're welding out in the shop and uh, a rag starts on fire and now the shop's on fire. Got a question, how will the firefighters get in and out of my property. I have been to some of your places and I know they are not easy to get into or out of. So consider what that access is like. Do you have bridges and culverts that are narrow that, uh, that maybe aren't up to snuff? Do you have narrow lanes with sharp curves? Are, are some of those curves sharp enough with, uh, with trees jutting out or rocks, things of that nature that the fire truck can't even get in? How about gates? Certainly we use gates cattle guards uh, as, as ways to manage our stock, but we also use those gates for, for keeping people out of places they shouldn't be. Are they locked? Are they wide enough for a fire truck to get in? Are they easy to open? Is that cattle guard that granddad put in back in the 30s or 40s stout enough to hold a tanker truck as it comes in filled with water? Um, think about that. Where's the septic and leach field? You wanna know why am I asking this? And then ask later though, you see that next bullet. Can they turn around? How often do you go to a farmstead or, or a ranch and note that there's only one place that's really open that doesn't have machinery parked on it, the fuel tanks or buildings or animals on it, and there's this one nice open area. It's typically where the leach field is. If I was a fire truck um, uh, coming in and need a place to turn around, I'd think, well, that's the only place I can turn around. What's gonna happen? I'm gonna get stuck. And to just drive home the point, you do not want one disaster or one emergency on top of another. So here's a situation, too much weight for this bridge. I know any number of you have bridges that were built any number of years ago, certainly before we started getting big trucks and trailers, but also before we got big firefighting equipment. So if you can't afford to build a bigger bridge, at least post for our friends who are coming to help us a weight uh, maximum so we don't, again, end up with an emergency on top of emergency. How about those outbuildings? And I ask you this, if you had to save an outbuilding, which one would it be? Think about that for a moment. Which outbuilding would you save? First of all, what kind of outbuildings do you have? What is the purpose for those outbuildings? Um, how big are they? You know, and that could impact how much effort could be taken uh, into consideration when, when fighting a fire of that building. Again, this could be a wildfire or a structure fire. What's that building made of and how will that make it easier or harder for the firefighters to work, uh, work on fighting those flames? And also about other values. Maybe the newest building um, is most important to you because it's one you've invested the most money in. Or maybe it's that log barn that the homesteaders built in the late 1800s is the most important to you. What's in those buildings and how is that gonna affect how they burn? We all have uh, grain and hay and machinery and oil and gas and potentially explosives. Um, maybe granddad had dynamite to blow up beaver dams that uh, has happened to sit in the hay mow for years. Should somebody know about that? Um, what's gonna be in those buildings and how does that impact how they burn? And what, again, coming back to the ethics, what are, are the ethical responsibilities we have in letting firefighters know what's in those buildings, how they might burn and what hazardous materials might impact um, what is gonna be the result here. And then also consider what's gonna help me get back into business. Do I need, if I've saved my horse because I know I'm gonna have to gather cattle after this fire, do I have a saddle? in which to ride, ride my horse? Um, what vet supplies am I gonna need if I have cattle that have been burned? Um, what 
what fencing tools do I need? How does where those items are stored impact what buildings you're going to prioritize when the Calvary comes in? Here is a beautiful scene. I was hoping we we're going to have a little time in the chat for you all to tell me what you saw, but we are running short on time. Just some things to observe. We've got ladder fuels here. We've got hay hanging out of the hay mow. We've got a roof that uh, the asphalt shingles are old, 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 and probably very flammable. We have exposed boards. We have dry grass building up to the house. Uh, I'm sorry, to the barn. So the things that Dan talked about that apply to our house, that, that defensible space, we have to remember that our outbuildings are vulnerable as well. So how does outside, what's outside impact the firefighting efforts? So do you have hay stored? Um, you have dry grass around? Where are things cleared out that we can uh, create a fire break? How about that propane tank? And have we kept all the grass clear around it so we can defend the space around that and not make it a potential, again, another potential emergency? Where is our farm fuel stored? I know most of you who are on a farmer ranch have hundreds, if not thousands of gallons of diesel and perhaps unleaded fuel. A fire coming creates a very volatile situation with that. And what can you do to mitigate that hazard? Here's a really good example. Here is farm fuel that is stored under roof with a metal roof. So if embers, as, as Dan was talking about, would get shedded more. It's also on a concrete pad. So that creeping fire, we have a little bit of a chance of getting that fought. And notice the secondary containment around those fuel tanks. If those tanks are to spill or, or get damaged, uh, if a fire were to come and not start things on fire, but in just melt the hoses and we have fuel leaking out, at least that secondary containment of that concrete wall will hold the fuel there and not put it on our ground or worse yet, release it downstream. What pastures could be impacted? You know, and only you know, where you've got cattle or sheep and, and where they could be impacted. And how would you handle those cattle? Do you handle cows and calves the same way you do yearlings? Absolutely not. So think about different plans and how you would handle those animals. Think about where your stock water is, how that was impacted by the fire. Um, and then also if a rain comes immediately after the fire, um, what do you need to do in order to make sure that your animals have access to clean and safe water? Think about the fire where it's going and where those, which fences are most likely to uh, go. What stock will mix? Um, do you have your heifers in next to the neighbor's Charlet bull? Um, is that a fence that is going to potentially get burned? And how does that change how you move those animals? And think about how can I mitigate any of these, uh, these impacts in advance? So remember that Every, that everything we've talked about, and we will continue to talk about for the next couple of nights, apply everywhere around your ranch, around the home and the outbuildings, around your fuel tanks, hay storage, and anything you want to defend. I want to show you this picture here. Fires can also begin at the ranch. And as we've seen ag burns get out of control the last few days, I implore you to think about how you are managing your own business in an effort to not start a wildfire. This is a silage pile at a dairy in northeastern Colorado. This was the end of March. Look at the fire that is happening here. This was due to faulty equipment that drove by the silage pit and sparks were thrown um, by some gears that were that were and bearings that were out. Um, here's some of the damage from that fire at that dairy. Now think if that happened at one of our ranches here. Um, We've now started not just a localized fire where we lose hundreds of thousands of dollars of, of our equipment and our, our business, but potentially our neighbors and have started a, a fire that our entire community is impacted by. I had a baler start on fire once. Um, not good. So don't be the cause of your own and others disaster. Please be careful. How do you do that? Make sure that your address is well posted so first responders can find you. Um, and certainly our address where our home is and is a mile away from the entrance to the ranch, make sure that that address is out there. Have sizable tested fire extinguishers at the fuel tanks, at your barns, at your shed, and in all your equipments and vehicles. There is a reason that the new balers come with a fire extinguisher attached to them. You don't want to start the wildfire because you were bailing your dryland alfalfa, a bearing went out, and we're off to the races. Get hoses hooked up, get things posted so anybody can find it. And the first thing you can do is Sign up for your reverse 911. Uh, Nathan talked about Mo saying earlier, 24 houses in the Middle Fork fire 
um, were in the evacuation area, only two were signed up for reverse 911. So do this tonight. Go to the Route County website, click on How Do I, and you'll see I've circled down there right next to 4 H, the next most important thing to sign up for. Sign up for emergency notifications. That will take you to this page. Click right there where the red circle is. Click here to sign up. Put in your address, your information. Let us know how to get a hold of you. And thank you, Sarah, for putting the chat, uh, the click in the chat. Also know that you do have resources. CSU Extension is here to help. This is our website. Um, this is in the packet. We have resources there available to you. One of the best resources here is through Pennsylvania State Extension. Um, the Ready Ag Workbook that you can help, it, that helps you walk through making plans for your ranch and how you're going to mitigate and evacuate. And then also the Ready, Set, Go curriculum has been um, altered for farmers and ranchers. Here's a checklist of things that you can check off as you move through your plan. And then also as the fire comes, um, knowing that you've taken care of things. I appreciate it. Kind of went through that in a hurry because I'd like to get some questions and I know our time is limited. Nathan, I'll turn it back to you. Excellent. Thank you, Todd. Um, this is a great chance to invite you back in, Dan, as well. Um, we're doing good on time. Our community is fortunate enough to have you to about 6.15. So I'd love to pose a couple of initial questions to the two of you here, and then we'll open up to the audience in full. Because we've just had you speaking here, Todd, can I ask you a first question? You bet. Um, so you, can you give us a window into the visit from the professional? So you've mentioned that this, this can happen, right? You've eked out a portion of your week um, and, and you're, someone's going to come to um, your ranch to speak with you. Who is that person? I tell you um, what. Who's, who's paying for this? Is there is there a cost involved? Can you give us a little bit of a window into that experience? Uh, yeah, I'll tell you, the first people I'd start with is our friends and my partners at the Colorado State Forest Service. Um, Dan's got coworkers here in John Twitchell and Carolina, uh, Manriquez, um, Bart Brown, Drew, and Drew's last name is escaping me, but call them 879-0475 and, and ask them if they can come out and start an evaluation and or help you figure out who else can start you with that, that evaluation. And certainly it's something that if I'm out on an agricultural site visit for other subjects, whether it's weed control, how to manage irrigation, et cetera, I'd be more than happy to look and at least help you think through a couple of these things um, before we bring our partners at the State Forest Service in. Great, thank you, Tom. Dan, I have a question for you. you. You give us a sense of the reality of embers as a threat, firebrands um, coming to us windborne, the fire is much farther afield. We may not get that sense of urgency yet, but our house is in fact under threat um, via that, that windborne um, transfer of embers right aloft. So it sort of underlines our need to imagine ember showers landing on our houses and properties can, can you briefly walk through like step one in a house audit, sort of seeing places that would receive an ember? How, how do you go in looking at a, at a home right at that early stage? So yeah, it's good good question, Nathan. There's a very systematic process um, promoted by the National Fire Protection Association and really they are kind of the foundational organization that really established this original um, home ignition zone risk assessment or risk evaluation uh, concept. So really the roof is the first place, you know, for a number of those reasons that I mentioned in the presentation, from a basic physical science perspective with the, with the, whether you think that way or not, and I don't certainly don't expect everybody in the audience to, but just because it's got the largest amount of surface area where embers coming from the sky could land, that's the most logical place to initiate your work, if you will. Um, you know, if I'm thinking about the potential for ember ignitions, otherwise decks also have very large surface areas and oftentimes do acquire, um, you know, larger accumulations of needle piles, like I mentioned in that one example of that, of that uh, one roof. But, um, you know, again, that's something that it really clicked for me one of the first times that I had heard it when I was starting to think about um, specific home assessments is the idea, you know, when we think about our own homes or our rentals or any property that we're familiar with and accustomed to, especially during windy conditions, you know those places where the wind will eddy 
and it will deposit pine needles and, and branches and dust and dirt and so on. So when you think about it that way and you envision those places there being where the debris lands, imagine also that the fire will drop embers in that exact same place. So, you know, it's, it's challenging, like it, you don't expect people to, to clean their gutters every week by any means, that's silly. But, you know, certain places like that are other good places to think of. I could ramble on for a while for sure, but um, those large surface areas are some of the most important to recognize. But again, when it comes to embers and ember intrusion, sealing up vents with screens is another very important action. Todd, if I could follow here for a, a second question to you, I'll ask one more to you, Dan, as well, before I, I open us up um, here. Um, Todd, you describe a triage scenario with one's outbuildings. Does that preference, the ranch owner's preference, need be communicated to first responders? If you're there, I would suggest it. it you do that. Um, if not, if you can't be there and you've been evacuated or you're moving your stock somewhere, you're on the other end of the ranch. Um, I don't know if Dan's had the opportunity to I'd leave a big note that says, or label my buildings if possible, you know, hey, dangerous materials in here, or save me first, you know, or also think about um, having a, a second trailer, not just for your stock, but some of those really important things that you're going to need to take with you, the saddle, um, some of those tools, you're going to need to get yourself back in business and take them with you if possible. That's good. Thank you. Um, Dan, one more sort of reading your property. I can I can think of one of my responses to information learned tonight is uh, heading out to where I live and looking upward with a, maybe a chainsaw in hand, knowing that fire behavior is strongly influenced by ladder fuels. Can you describe what you look for as you walk around and look upward at trees around your property? What does that mean? How do I read that? What action do I take? Is this about clear cutting? <laughs> No, thank you for that, that question, Nathan. Um, it, clear cutting is generally not necessary at virtually any property. Now, um, this is one of the things that I'll go ahead and give the little bit of a pitch to the home ignition zone update. It was traditionally entitled the FIRE 2012-1 document. It was oftentimes uh, referred to as the Defensible Space Guide. Um, but we've kind of modified the name in order to reiterate uh, more emphatically and clearly and directly the importance of the home ignition concept and structure ignitability concept. Um, we have a, an appendix in that document that addresses variability of different forest types because we have so many here in the state of Colorado. It's a real luxury that we have in a state like this, but uh, there are certain forest types where selective thinning um, may not not bode well because it can expose remaining trees to wind throw kinds of conditions. And uh, there's a lot of factors that, that are involved. But to more directly answer your question, Nathan, you know, it's, it's, it's rather important to think of that continuity concept. So although it's rare, uh, virtually everybody has seen images of fire burning through tree canopies. Significantly fewer have witnessed it in person. But really, you know, the way under most conditions to eliminate that possibility or likelihood is to thin out those trees and reduce the amount of canopy you have present to burn. Um, so, you know, in, in a general sense, the fewer trees that you have and the fewer pounds that you have adjacent to one another, um, the, the less likelihood you obviously have of, of fire being active in that tree canopy under most conditions. Is that helpful? Yeah, Dan, that's excellent. Great, I, you know, I'd like to transition us now to our open Q&A. Um, to do so, I wanna invite in my colleague, Carolina Manriquez, Forester, Northwest Area, Colorado State Forest Service. Carolina, welcome. Um, I can see questions coming in from the audience. Feel free to um, introduce some of those questions here. Yes, thank you very much. So there's an array of questions. I'm gonna to try to compile them so that we can answer as many as possible. There's a question regarding um, the installation of water storage or cisterns to uh, aid and, and protection during a fire. So would you recommend uh, store, you know, recommend installing some sort of storage? And if so, what would be that minimum amount of water 
that should be stored. Same question along the lines of gel or foam products. Is that something we should be recommending uh, for landowners to, to invest in? Thanks, Carolina. Yeah, I glanced at those questions earlier and, and I'll start with the water question. My take on this is that if you don't have any other true need for that water on your property, there's no need to install it expressly for fire suppression purposes. And the reason I say this is because it's very hard to know what kind of fire conditions will exist at your property at that time. So if you invested a very significant amount of money for a just in case scenario and the fire comes blowing in and there's no possibility that anybody could be there to utilize that water, it would be an unfortunate investment in, in, in time, effort and money, realistically. Uh, if there's a reasonable other purpose that that water needs to be utilized for, whatever it may be, I would suggest a minimum of 500 gallons, but from a fire resource perspective, a fire management perspective, the more the better. I mean, I'd be much happier to find a cistern full of 2,500 gallons rather than 250 for sure. Um, onto the gel uh, or um, foam question. That's not really something that we recommend homeowners invest in, in part because uh, it's very hard to know for sure exactly when a fire will in fact impact your specific property. Sometimes it can be very surprising how rapidly a fire does arrive at any one property. And also you can be surprised that a fire may not arrive at all, right? Because the wind shifts or rain comes or whatever the case may be. But application by homeowners themselves, um, it's not at all to say that certain homeowners or ranch owners wouldn't have that kind of equipment available to them, but it's also important to recognize that virtually all of those products have a limitation to their efficacy, right? If you apply it, certain products like that are only viable for a few hours, maybe a few days. And if you don't recognize a fire impact within that period of time, it's really done you no good. I wouldn't necessarily consider that a worthwhile investment uh, for our, a landowner, but you know, I wouldn't necessarily dis discourage it. Just ensure you are familiar with what it is that you're investing in and the likelihood that you yourself would be able to utilize that very product with a very dynamic and really unknowable environment. Thank you. Um, another question that kind of, we got several versions of the question has to do with propane tanks. Um, you know, propane tanks above ground, below ground, surrounded by a wood fence. How do we, how do we defend the, the propane tank? Um, and would the berry proposition be safer for, uh, for, for, for a fire around a house? Minimal distance of 30 feet from the structure um, on the same contour as the structure itself, preferably buried, if not eliminate all fuels from within 10 feet of it and replace a wooden fence with a non-combustible fence for some quick and direct answers. Yeah. And the, 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 the HIZ guide you were referring to also talks about propane tanks, right? Um, yeah, to a limited extent, yep. Yeah. There's also a question about, uh, you know, forest types and, and the fire behavior associated to the different forest types we have, you know, aspen forest versus fir spruce forest versus scrub oak. Um, you know, how do people look at their immediate environment and, and think about what the fire will do there. Promoting aspens or any other broadleaf trees is preferable to any conifer. And by conifer, I mean a tree with needles essentially and with cones. Um, so if you can select for uh, aspen, cottonwood, willow, uh, maple, any other broadleaf or deciduous tree as opposed to conifer, that's preferential. That's not always a luxury that every landowner has, obviously. Um, I did see some of those questions and, uh, you know, when it comes to, to scrub oak, for example, um, it's okay to have any of these species on your property, but the real critical piece for folks to know is you just need to have appropriate spacing from one plant to the next, essentially. You can have clumps of plants but you need to have them separated from one another so that if fire and, and encounters 
these clusters or bundles or packages of vegetation, uh, it can consume them but then we want to minimize its ability to continue to transition to other fuels, essentially. So I, I feel like that's that well. continuity you've been talking about, breaking that continuity, Precisely. be it horizontally or vertically. So being exactly. strategic in that spacing. Um, there is a question about a chipping, you know, when you do mitigation, um, is chipping a reasonable way to get rid of a slash? Or does that add to the fire danger? What 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 are we saying about the thickness of of that mastication chip? That's a great question. And uh, the Colorado Forest Restoration Institute produced a very good analysis, albeit it was specific to the Front Range of Colorado uh, for mulching. So they utilized this this phrase of mulching for both chipping and mastication and other means of basically processing woody material, whether it's branches, larger stems. Uh, whatever the case may be. Chipping is a perfectly acceptable means by which that vegetation can be modified. Uh, what's critically important is ensuring that that material is distributed as far away from the property as possible, excuse me, from the structure at risk as possible. So you should never ever blow chips within zero to five feet of the, of the structure of the home. Um, from within five to 30 feet, you should not have it done there either. It should be a minimum of 30 feet or more away, um, but you want it to be discontinuous. You know, traditionally in most forestry applications, we have a minimum chip depth preferred of four inches <clears throat> or less, no more. Um, that can be variable depending upon site conditions and so on. But for anybody that's used the chipper, you know that you can angle the shoot, right? So if you put a lot of material through a chipper and you have four inches of material pile up in one place, make sure you turn the chute a significant distance so those chip piles are not directly adjacent to one another. Because when those chips get to burning, it can be a really unpleasant mess and it actually can produce an astounding amount of heat. The last uh, comment I, I will make tonight before passing it back to Nathan has to do with, um, you know, folks are wondering how do we work as a community if we're in um, a small group, group of homes, how do, we, how do we do this? How do we put together a plan for uh, an HOA? And that will be the topic uh, next week. Um, so be sure to join us also, you know, regarding grants, like how do you go about funding the, these efforts? How do you work with your neighbors? How do you work with, you know, a different ownership on the other side of the fence, be it a federal or state partner? We're going to be talking about this next week um, and try to answer all of those questions. Um, back to you, Nate. Thanks. Great. Thank you, Carolina. Our sincere thanks, Dan and Todd for your presentations this evening, for handling questions from our community and for providing critical insights into the home ignition zone, ready, set, go framework, immediate actions we can take as individual homeowners and ranchers. Really rich content tonight. Thank you both. Um, to you, our audience, thank you for your attendance and engagement this evening. I think we're unable to address all of your questions, but the council will save them. And please do send any more questions that occur to you post webinar to our website. That Route County Wildfire Mitigation Council website will help you stay informed, get prepared. Um, I would close with the sentiment here, our commitment to our own safety and the preparedness of our homes and ranches really is essential to keeping our landscape and our community safe. Watch for a post webinar survey sent to your email Carolina, great lead in to our forthcoming webinar here. Please join us for our next webinar, which is next Thursday, May 13th, focusing on HOAs and small communities. So with that, enjoy the remainder 